So we've been covering a Sunday school class on the doctrines of grace, and I mean for this to be a class time, even though it's a we're kind of have a bigger group now. So I would, what I mean by that is I would like your interaction when I would ask questions, or as some other teachers have said, I might have to pick you out if you don't raise your hand or speak up. So let's go ahead and review what we've covered in the past few weeks. What is total depravity? How do you define the total depravity? Pastor Rick taught that, that class. Yes, that's right. It's a total lack of spiritual good, an inability to do good before God. Okay, so you're in this box and you have the, the total depravity disease of your soul. Okay, next we have unconditional election. How is that defined? Chase? Yes. So completely by his grace, he's going to pick out and save a particular people. A certain number of people. Okay? He's elected these two. Not because they're the, they look the best or because they are of any foreseen merit in them, but only by God's mercy and grace. Okay, now limited atonement. Brian? Uh, that the atonement of Christ is um, not limited in his power, but limited in his scope. No. In that it was an actual sacrifice, not a potential sacrifice. And that it is a substitutionary atonement for God's chosen elect. Yes, very good, very good. So here I'm going to put that Christ paid a particular price for his elect. And now here we are at irresistible grace. This grace that comes to a particular people is a grace that cannot be resisted because it is a sovereign work of God to remove our resistance, to remove our hatred for him, and instead give us a great love for him. So... Let's think about how we define irresistible grace. Here's a quote from James White. Irresistible grace, then, is simply the assertion that God's grace expressed sovereign and in the sovereign free act of regeneration is irresistible. When God chooses to raise one of his elect to life, he can do so without asking permission of the dead creature. You understand what he's saying? saying that we are much worse than we credit ourselves to be. We are dead creatures, and that's why irresist grace is irresistible. Because it's not a matter of you simply making the choice, but it's a matter of you being dead, and he makes you alive. Some people have opposed the doctrine of grace, the doctrines of grace, with especially with irresistible grace and saying such things as that it is God forcing himself upon people. Or some have so gone so far as to say that it is cosmic rape, that irresistible grace is God making people into robots and forcing them to believe. Okay, I'm going to read you a quote by C.S. Lewis, well-known author, and then you've got to tell me what's wrong with it. Okay? Okay, this is from his writing it in The Trouble with X is the title. 
God has made it a rule for himself that he won't alter people's character by force. He can and will alter them, but only if people will let him. And that way he has really and truly limited his power. Sometimes we wonder why he has done so or even wish that he hadn't, but apparently he thinks it's worth doing. He would rather have a world of free beings with all its risks than a world of people who did right like machines because they couldn't do anything else. The more we succeed in imagining what a wor world of perfect automatic beings would be like, the more I think we shall see his wisdom. What's wrong with that statement, right? Yes. So th that's very well stated. It's not man that's central in his will, but God. No. Yep. Yes. Nolan? Yes, it's an impossibility because of how wicked we are. He's underestimating how sinful we are. We are so sinful and born this way that we would never come to him unless he were to move in his grace. You must be born again. That's the bottom line of this lesson. You need grace that's irresistible. You need grace that's right from God himself. You need a miracle of the soul. You must be born again. You can't simply make yourself a Christian whenever you want. You need a savior. You don't have just, you're not sick or broken. You're dead in your trespasses and sins. You need a resurrection. With the doctrines of grace, it's been well said that with these doctrines, when you believe them and understand them, they are the continental divide of theology. And what that illustration means is there, there's like the Rocky Mountains, right, on the, in our continent. And when r rain hits on one side of the Rockies, then it's going to flow out to the Pacific Ocean. When rain hits on the other side of the Rockies, it grows down to rivers, and the rivers flow to the Atlantic Ocean. And the idea is that on that one mountain, you could have the same rain cloud, drop, drops of water, and they're either going to flow out to the Atlantic Ocean or to the Pacific. It depends on which side of the mountain they fall on, that continental divide. The doctrines of grace are a continental divide of theology. If you deny them, then you become very man-centered in your thinking, very man-centered in your understanding of salvation, very man-centered, and you begin to become pragmatic. Easy believism grows in the soil of Arminianism. Easy believism grows in the soil of Arminianism. Arminianism is not a heresy. It doesn't make you not a Christian, but it makes it very easy to have heresy. It begins a slide into man-centered ideas. If God is the one who must save by irresistible grace, if he must make people born again, and if he does this because we are totally depraved, and in order for these things to go together, think with me now if they're not true. Okay, that man is not totally depraved, and that he can decide for himself. Then I can begin to change my message 
not to please God, but instead I will change it to what can persuade people to repent. Haven't you ever been preaching the gospel and someone comes up to you and says, let me give you a word of advice. You know, I know you just told me about the Bible and I know I've never read the Bible, but let me tell you about how to reach people for your religion. You've got to do it such and such this way. And then you kindly explain to them, well, the message, message that I've told you is not something that I'm telling you because I want to woo you or because I believe I'm a salesman, but it's instead this is what God would have me to say. See the differences there? Are you a salesman trying to persuade people into the kingdom? Or are you a messenger, an ambassador of God, trying to speak the words of God in a way that pleases God? Who is the one who saves? But yes, God saves. Now, do you really believe that? If you don't hold these doctrines, there, there is a, a way in which you don't really believe that God saves. You must be born again. Yes, Dan? Yes. Yes. We... Yes, you're right. We do reason with people. We just reason with them the way the Bible shows us to reason with them. Not the way the world tells us to reason with them. Thank you for making that clear. Okay, so th think here now about a couple more quotes that help make the definition of irresistible grace more clear. This is from Bethlehem Baptist Church up in Minnesota, Minneapolis. More specifically, irresistible grace refers to the sovereign work of God to overcome the rebellion of our heart and bring us to faith in Christ so that we can be saved. If our doctrine of total depravity is true, there can be no salvation without the reality of irresistible grace. If we are dead in our sins, totally unable to submit to God, then we will never believe in Christ unless God overcomes our rebellion. You understand that? The key is to irresistible grace is that God himself overcomes our rebellion. He doesn't move apart from our will. He instead overcomes our rebellion to him. Quote number two, when a person hears a preacher call for repentance, he can resist that call. But, God, but if God gives him repentance, he cannot resist because the gift is the removal of resistance. See, the gift is the removal of resistance. Not being willing to repent is the same as resisting the Holy Spirit. So if God gives repentance, it is the same as taking away the resistance. That is why this work of God is called irresistible grace. Okay, so let's go ahead and we're going to look at the general call and effectual call then John 6, and then we're going to look at applications. So let's go ahead and turn to Matthew twenty-two fourteen. 14. Brian, would you read Matthew twenty-two fourteen? 14? So where do we see the effectual call in that verse? Go ahead, say, what do you say that again, Brian? So few are chosen, we see the effectual call in, in, with election. Where's the, the general call? So many are called, but it's only effectual with the, those that are chosen. Do you see that? So both the effectual call and the general call. The effectual call is irresistible grace where when God makes a dead sinner alive, when someone is born again, the general call is the gospel that goes out to everybody. That distinction is, helps you understand the difference between many of, with many of the objections with the irresistible grace. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 1.9. And Lee, would you read 1 Corinthians 1.9?
Okay, now this is an introduction. Many of the introductions have some key words that are used, like slave of Christ or someone who is, a, is called here. Here, speaking to the church at Corinth, the Apostle Paul refers to them as people who have been called effectually. God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. This is the effectual call. Okay, let's look at Romans 8, 28 to 30. Romans 8, 28 to 30, he says, Verse 28, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called, according to his purpose. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified, and whom he justified, these he also glorified. So how do we know the called in verse 28 and verse 30 is not the general call? So he justifies them, he sanctifies them, and glorifies them. So with everybody who gets the general call, do they get sanctified, justified, glorified? No? No one? Yes, I believe so. That's right. Yep, the, the called is those who are effectually called according to his purpose. You see that? That's what the purpose of the little um, stick figure analogy is to see that he, his purpose in tulip, his purpose in total depravity, un unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, his is a eternal purpose, something that he has planned, and that is why, um, in the end, we have perseverance. We have assurance that we will persevere to the end, because this eternal work of God has begun, and before time began. Okay, so let's look now at First Peter one three. Since the effectual call. will always come to pass, whomever God wants to save, he will save. In that is the idea of regeneration. In that is the idea that you must be born again. Go ahead, Josh, would you read 1 Peter 1, 3 and 1, 23? One three and one twenty three. So there we see that he's begotten us again. The same idea as that we have been born again. In verse twenty three. So here, how does someone get born again? Through the word of God. Through the word of God. That's a, a beautiful picture that the, the Holy Spirit rides in the chariot of his word. So someone is born again, and it is a work of God the Spirit. Let's look at John 3. In John 3, verses 3 to 8, And Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So we see that th this is a an absolute necessity. It's an absolute must. You mu if you want to go to heaven when you die, you've got to be born again. 
Every single person in the room wants to be born again, right? You, you've, so how does this happen? And Nicodemus says, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but you cannot tell where it comes and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the spirit. So God decides who will be saved. God decides in his election. And in his irresistible grace, he moves as the wind moves. And no one can tell who he will save. This, these doctrines that we've been going over are really some of the most offensive doctrines in all the Bible. Why is total depravity offensive? Yes, pride. Let's, let's work that out. Let's flush that out. Give us some details to it. <laughs> That's it. We could answer that, that one to every question. <laughs> Why is it having pride? <laughs> so we, let's give it some practical example. Why, why is our, our pride not like that? Mm-hmm. Yes, they, they don't like the offense of its unconditional election worked out. That God has elected and chosen a certain people, and so he's paid the price for certain people, and that offense continues on. So what about irresistible grace? Why is that offensive? Yes, because it's an affront to free will. Now what I want you to see in all those offenses and thinking about all them, they're all based in that you don't get the T right. You see that? If you get the T right, then it's going to set you a right. Do you really see how sinful you are. I love the doctrines of grace. I love to think about them. I love to sing about them. And you know why? Because they exalt the gospel. In the gospel, we see that we are wicked people, sinful people, that we have been foolish people. What we should have known to do, we were fools to disobey God the way that we have. We were ignorant, we were disobedient. What we did know, then we defied God in it. We were slaves to our sin. What we did know and what we didn't want to do all the time, we, we, we were overcome by our lusts and desires. I know that we knew that it was wrong, but we're going to go ahead and do it anyway. And all of this worked itself out in our lives, lives full of envy, hateful, and hating one another. And in our best works, we had all these sins of pride. We have been totally depraved from the womb to the tomb. But in sovereign grace, in a grace that is completely apart from us, that it's a work of God Almighty where he acts, he's the one who moves, he's the one who comes searching for us. The idea of irresistible grace is pictured in the story of the, the parable of the, um, the lost son. The, and his father 
who goes searching for him. Who's the one who searches for the son? But the, the father was the one looking down the ro- road, waiting for the prodigal son to return. In the idea of the lost sheep, who goes out but the, the shepherd goes and finds his lost sheep? That in irresistible grace is the idea that if God didn't come looking for us, then we would have never turned to him. It, but because of that, whoever God goes looking for, he finds. He's effectual for that. He doesn't lose them, but they persevere to the end. All of his elect, he will make sure that they are saved. This is a very encouraging doctrine. It puts trust and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's look in John 6. In John 6, we have the feeding of the 5,000 where the Lord has been preaching the gospel and the people have been with him for days and so he, out of, the Lord Jesus Christ, out of compassion, he considers how they need to be fed and he has them sit down in a grassy area and he begins to ask and in verse 5, he says to Philip, our Lord says to Philip, where shall we buy bread that these may eat? And John lets us in in verse 6 to let us know that it was a trick question. Jesus said, but this he had said to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. He just wanted Philip to really think about it, what's going to happen. And Philip answered, 200 denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them may have a little. So, in effect, Philip says, you know, $20,000 wouldn't be able to buy lunch for all these people. Where are we going to get 20,000 bucks? Jesus says this, knowing this, in order to set up this miracle. And this miracle is there to set up the doctrines of of grace. To set up what is the gospel really like. What is it like when someone gets converted? And what's it like when there's a false convert? He's going to set that up where there's a feeding of the 5,000. That miracle is a miracle of amazing grace to the people. And after he's done with a miracle, Jesus sends the disciples over the Sea of Galilee. And he begins to, at night, he walks across the Sea of Galilee and gets in the boat in the middle of the sea. The next day, they are in a synagogue on the other side of the Sea of Galilee in Capernaum. In verse 26, we pick up the story where the people have been looking for Christ. And they find him in They say in verse 25, Rabbi, when did you come here? In verse 26, Jesus answered and said, Most assuredly, I say to you, you you seek me, not because you saw the signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Now, I'm a mechanic at work, and one thing the mechanics at work love is free lunch. (laughs) When there's free lunch, everybody at work is, is happy for just, for a couple hours. Complaining tends to go away when the bellies get full. But then when it gets to be the next meal time, the complaining comes back. Oh, we should get paid more. Oh, this is such a stressful job. But then when you get free lunch, you kind of forget about it for a little while again. The lunch doesn't solve the problem. The problem is a matter of the heart. The miracle doesn't solve the problem here for these people. It's a matter of the heart, and the Lord is going to expose their hearts in this conversation. He ver- says in verse 27, Do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has set his seal on him. The, the Lord Jesus is turning them away from, stop thinking about free food and start thinking about what is in front of you, the Savior of the world. You're coming to me because I got you lunch but I have eternal life. Do they have eyes to see? Do they have ears to hear? Jesus often does this, especially in the book of John. John loves to to display how Jesus turns these life um, pictures into spiritual lessons. Throughout the book of John, can you think of 
one or two where, the, where Jesus does this in the book of John, where he takes a, like, water at the woman, with the woman at the well. And he says, well, I have water to, for you to drink that you'll, you'll never thirst again. And he takes this imagery and he makes an eternal life gospel lesson out of it. What's another example in the book of John? No one? Yes, he, he has a, an actual act that he does there where he raises Lazarus from the dead and he does that act as a, as a picture and a statement about salvation through, for the rest of time for people to look back and see, for him to say, I'm the resurrection and the life. So that we can read that now and we can be saved from reading that story. What's another picture? Yes, that Jesus is the bread of life. And he's going to get into that picture here. He also goes with Nicodemus, he says, about being born again, like, like we read. Throughout the book of John, you see these pictures, and here the bread of life is, is on display. In verse 28, then he said to him, what shall we do that we may work the work of God? The people begin to, to say, okay, what work do we got to do? What do we got to do in order to... They, they understand he's talking about salvation now. What do we got to do? And he said, this is the work of God, that you believe in him who, whom he sent. This is something they're not ready to do. We'll see in verse 30. Therefore they said to him, what sign will you perform then that we may see it and believe you? What work will you do? Our fathers ate the manna in the desert, as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Now, like a typical evangelism story, the person who's lost here is quoting scripture, and it's misquoted. They're quoting the Psalms, and they've completely missed the whole idea. Jesus says to them, okay, you want to do the works of God? Believe on me. And they say, okay, we'll believe. Show us a sign. Moses gave us a sign, free lunch. And Jesus says to them in verse 32, You've, you miss the entire point. Most assuredly, I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Here you see in verse 33 is a limited atonement because it is an actual giving of life. It's not a potential giving of life, but it's an actual he gives life. Then they said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them plainly, he says to them plainly, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me, and you, yet you do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will by no means cast out. Where do you see the doctrines of grace in verse 37? That they will persevere. We see the, the P, the perseverance of the saints. They will. He will not cast them out. What else? My love? Yes, we see unconditional election. The Father is the one who gives them to the Son. And what else? Yes, that's right. They still won't believe. That's right. It's not a doubt. It's going to happen because it's irresistible. So continuing on in verses 38, Jesus says, For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of the Father who sent me, that all he has given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up in the last day. Where's the doctrines of grace in that verse? Verse. 
Nolan? Yes, certain people that he's chosen. What else? Yes, they, he's, going to, he's not going to lose a one. He's going to raise them up in the last day. They will persevere. Verse 40, and this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life, and I'll raise him up in the last day. Then the, Jew, then the Jews complained about him because he said, I'm the bread of life who came down from heaven. They said, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? You remember where they're at. They're in around the Sea of Galilee. This is Jesus' own hometown area. How is it then that he says, I've come down from heaven? And the Lord rebukes them in verse 43. And how does he rebuke them but with the doctrines of grace? Jesus therefore answered and said to them, do not murmur among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him and I will raise him up in the last day where are the doctrines of grace there that's right they, they need monergistic regeneration they need to be born again that's right it has to be a work of the father drawing them. And the drawing them is a word there that um, some people who are Arminian try to de describe this drawing as if um, it was something that attracts you. Like, oh wow, look at that. That's so beautiful. And I'm drawn to it. Like, you know, the moth to the flame or the mosquito to that blue light that zaps them. I'm drawn to the light, you know. And that's not the word, that, the right meaning to the word here. The, the word is described for, in many places in the New Testament, sometimes as dragging a fishnet, um, as sometimes drag, being dragged before court. Uh, that it's the idea that the Lord comes and takes his elect and brings them, saves them, brings them home. We also see the perseverance of the saints, that he will raise them up in the last day. In verse 45, it's written in the prophets that they shall be taught by God. Therefore, everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. What, where do we see the doctrines of grace here? In verse 45. Sergio? That's right. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to him. And he goes on to say that not everyone who has seen the Father except he was from God. He has seen the Father. We know that to be Jesus, right? Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me has everlasting life. I am the bread of life. You notice while Jesus preaches about the doctrines of grace, where does he put the responsibility? On them. That's right, he's preaching about how you need a savior, you need to be born again, but he presses upon them and convicts them and rebukes them for their wickedness, for their refusal to come to him. He says in verse 50, this is the bread which comes down from heaven that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread... And he points to himself. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Here is, is a specific giving. It's, again, it's not a potential giving, but he actually gives his life for the world. And the, the world would be like the way that is a representative for mankind. A representative, I'm sorry, not for for all those in mankind. We also see the perseverance of the saints, that he will live forever in this verse, the one who has eternal life. The Jews therefore quarreled among themselves, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? 
they, they are offended. They're offended at the idea. Um, many times when you're evangelizing, somebody, who, the person who's hearing you, has so many misunderstandings um, because of their sin that if you were to spend all day there talking to them, those misunderstandings would never go away. They would still be offended at the end. Have you ever talked to somebody like that? <laughs> Some of you have spent all day talking to people, apparently. <laughs> and they go away mis completely misrepresenting you, saying, this person says this crazy idea. Like I remember Jimmy and I were evangelizing somebody after a service before, and then one of the ladies in the church talked with them, and they, they said, um, those guys were teaching that you could lose your salvation. <laughs> and they came, and the, the person came to us to hear about the conversation afterwards, and it couldn't be anything further from the truth. We tried to repeatedly make that clear. You cannot lose your salvation in this particular evangelism conversation. But the, the point is, that's what's happening here. The people here are completely misrepresenting Jesus because of the total depravity they don't understand. Because they're there for the wrong reason, they want to use Jesus, they don't understand what he's talking about. But by God's grace, some of the people in that crowd do. Some of those people who are his own. Some of those people who know that they need the bread of life. And that they're there not just for a meal, but to be saved. Not just to live for an afternoon off some food, but to live forever. Yes, they're there for dinner and a show. Now Jesus says to them in verse 53, Most assuredly I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up in the last day. There's the perseverance of the saints. The person here, Jesus is speaking in pictorial language about the person who depends on the work that Christ has done on the cross. The person who admits that everything they've done has been corrupted will see they need a savior. Do you remember the story of the leper who comes to Jesus in Mark 1? And that leper, you remember leprosy is, is a disease that will kill you. It, leprosy is a disease that destroys your nerve endings so that you begin to wear away your own body because you don't feel what you're rubbing up against, what you're, how you're cutting yourself, how you're um, destroying your own body. And you begin to wear away your face. It, the leprosy attacks your organs. The leprosy makes you, um, your fingers and digits become stubs. It makes the features on your face melt away so that you, your form of your face looks that, like a lion, like the way that your nose melts away. And it makes a stench so that when a leper comes, you, you smell them, you see them, you hear them cry, unclean, unclean, unclean. And you remember in Mark 1, when the leper comes to the Lord, he comes with humility, having to feel the shame of those who of walking through the crowd and they, the people gasping, the people throwing stones. What rabbis used to say, I wouldn't eat, a, I wouldn't buy an egg on the street that a leper walked. Uh, lab, rabbis would pride themselves in throwing stones at lepers and not being near them. And the leper in Mark 1 comes to Christ and Christ reaches out and he touches him. And it's a very intentional touching, as if he puts two hands on his, both his shoulders. And the man who hasn't felt a human touch in, in years. And the leper falls before him on the ground, and he says, if you're willing, you can make me clean. And the Lord says to him, with that touch, he says, I'm willing. Be cleansed. 
Do you see your total depravity? That you are a leper of the soul? Do you humble yourself to come on your face before God and say, I need God by his grace to draw me. I need God to do a work in my soul, to take away the resistance that I have in my soul. That's irresistible grace where you come like a, and admit you have a, you're a leper of the soul and that it's going to take a work of God alone, a work of God alone to save you. I often use the analogy when I'm, when I'm evangelizing about ca- cancer and the guy who's smoking. And the guy who's smoking and he gets lung cancer and he gets cancer in his mouth and then he says to the doctor pridefully, well, I know I got cancer, but you know, I'll just throw these things away. See, I can quit whenever I want. I got willpower. I quit whenever I want, and I can exercise too. And the doctor says, you fool, your exercise and you're throwing away your cigarettes won't take away the cancer. Humble yourself. Come, and I will cut it out. And he says, no thanks, doc. I got it covered. What happens to that man? He dies. He must admit he needs someone else to do the work. He needs someone else. And it is the same with the doctrines of grace. You must come to see, I need God to save me. I need his irresistible grace. That's what Christ is trying to describe to these people here. That they need to turn from their own self-righteousness to depend on his flesh and blood. That kind of humility. That I need Christ to pay for my sins. He says in verse 55, for my flesh is food indeed and my blood is drink indeed. Oh yes, the work of Christ, that Christ has done is the work that pleases God. That's the work to pay for sins. That's what you need to cover your sin. Verse 56, he who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him as the living father sent me and I live because of the father. So he who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread which came down from heaven. Not as your father has ate the manna and are dead. He who eats this bread will live forever. Now even the disciples found these things hard to hear. Even many people who are Christians find the doctrines of grace hard to hear. And Jesus says in verse 60, this is a hard, hard saying, or the disciples say this is a hard saying, who can understand it? And Jesus knew in verse 61 in himself the disciples complained about this. Does this offend you? Is this not fair? Is this hard to understand? He says in verse 63, it is the spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. Do you see the irre- irresistible grace in verse 63? It's the spirit who gives life. The words that I speak to you are spirit and they're life. But there are some of you who do not believe. Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe. And again, irresistible grace in verse 65. Therefore I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted to him by my Father. When God grants it, every sinner, when God grants his grace, that sinner will come to him. Yes, please. Hmm. Amen. Yes. So think with me now to close. What are some applications of irresistible grace? If you believe this, what differences will it make in your life? No one? Yes. It, it, yes, the humility will stay with you for the rest of your life. If you believe that you've been born again, not of flesh, not of your own will, but of God, then you would continually, every day you'd be thanking the Lord that he saved you. A wretched soul. And you look out and you see so many people just like you that are lost. And you would look at yourself, you wouldn't look at yourself with pride, but you'd say, that's right. That's the application that Jesus brings here with the disciples. They feel the shame of the thousands of people leaving and they feel ashamed to be there alone. And and Jesus explains to them, why are you so ashamed? 
I'm, we're speaking words of the Spirit. Trust in the Lord and who's converted and who's not. It is a work of the Lord. It should make you fervent and depend on Him with a, with a great strength. Let's go ahead and move close. Dear Lord God, we thank you that you have made your grace irresistible to us. We know that if you didn't take away our resistance, our opposition, and our hatred for you, we would have gone on resisting you forever, even in hell, Lord. And we thank you for your grace. Please help us to live with a fervency and a holiness and a trust in you and a worship of you, that you would receive all the glory. Please receive all the glory from this doctrine in our lives. Amen.